him. First John chapter 3 is where we are tonight. First John chapter 3 in the New Testament, in the back of the New Testament, the book is First John chapter 3. We've covered two chapters so far. Hallelujah. Isn't God good? Amen. He has so much to say. 
Remember now, John is speaking to those who are born again. He's speaking to Christians. He's speaking to you. <laughs> He's speaking to me. So John is, is reminding brand new Christians to hold fast to what they believe. He tells them for a surety that you need to hold fast to what you believe. He struggles with the fact that they are struggling with the fact that there are false prophets and heresies out there. So tonight we begin chapter 3. He ended chapter, chapter 2 by talking about practicing righteousness. What is practicing righteousness? Practicing righteousness. Anybody? Living right. L living living right. right thing. Saying the right thing. Spread the word. Righteousness. And with the right attitude. So we have to understand that God blesses us and he blesses us more abundantly when we get it right. And when we get it right and we know it's right. Because we humans, with the human nature, many times we get it wrong and we know we got it wrong. Are you with me? <coughs> Peter, Peter got it wrong. Peter got it wrong. He denied Christ. And guess what? He knew he was wrong. And when he got it wrong and knew he was wrong, Jesus didn't say a moment word, but what did he do? He just, just looked at him. He didn't say a word. He just looked at him. What was his look? What, what did his look say? Disappointment. Disappointment? Anything else? I told you so. Possibly? What else could his look be saying? Why? Why? What else could, was the look, say again? Haven't given up on you still. No, oh, okay. So even when we mess up, Jesus invite, invites us to the fish fry. Isn't that something? Uh -huh. Even when we mess up and there's a gathering of the clergy and a gathering of the saints of God, he says, also bring Peter. He said, especially Peter. Why does he have to single Peter out? Go tell my disciples to meet me in Galilee, and what you do on your way here, stop by Peter's house. Stop by Peter's cave. Stop by Peter's place and tell him to come on to me. Why was that necessary? First of all, so that Peter would know that he has not been cast aside. And okay. also that the other apostles would know that Peter was still welcome. <laughs> my, my, my. So it is important for our esteem to know that God still loves us. And it's just as important for the brethren to know that God still welcomes us because, you know, human beings can be tough. Human beings can be critical. Uh -huh. Human beings can remind you of your failures. But thank God that Jesus is different than human beings. I said Jesus is different than human beings, but at the same time, Jesus is a human being. So what am I saying? Jesus has a different attitude, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight in chapter 3. Uh, Jesus... It's different than we are, but we ought to always strive to be as he is. We ought to strive. So, so John begins chapter 3 with the exclamation point and with a question, but it's a rhetorical question. What is a rhetorical question? He already know the answer. He's not asking it for an answer. Okay, so he's not he's not asking the question because of the answer. He's just trying to invoke thought. He's he's trying to remind us. So so John reminds us, and and then later on I, I'll tell you what else he does. Behold, what matter of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. God's love for us is so great 
John says is simply amazing. <laughs> he says, even though he knows God, it's still astonishing to him. John says, behold, he says, look, see, perceive, understand. Behold, this great love that God has for us, it is simply amazing to me. Some of you would not be friends with who you're friends with or married to who you're married with if you knew all. Some of you would not be neighbors living next door to who you're living next do door to if you knew all before you moved there. And check this out. Some of you, once you would have found out all, would have moved out the neighborhood. Because you don't have that amazing love that we all ought to strive for when it comes to the God type of love, the this agape love, this unconditional love. We got conditions on everything, for everything, about everything. We got conditions. I don't go to work because they don't pay me. If I'm going to work, they got to pay me. So I'm only going to work based on one condition. Not because I love my job. How many of you love your job so much until they can go a week without paying you and you won't say a mumbling word? <laughs> you wouldn't think bad of them at all. Anybody? No. Matter of fact, how many of you would just go to your boss and say, thank you for allowing me to have this good job? Not. It's a privilege just to be here. <laughs> Sister Woods spent 42 years going to the same place but I guarantee you, two weeks, one month, first or 15th, whatever the pay period was, she was looking for it. You are right. And if it had not been where it's supposed to be, whether on a check stub or a check or ACH or some kind of payment arrangement, guess what? That's gonna be a problem. That Christian girl. <laughs> would not show herself Christianly. <laughs> John says, behold, perceive, understand, behold, what manner. Stop at that word manner because the word manner interjects the thought of what's possible. What sort of love? What he says here is, is that the type of love that God has is a, a manner of love that is totally possible, totally through God. If you love people unconditionally, you must be born again. If people just keep doing you right, and then, did, then do you wrong, then they do you right, and in between there you still love them, guess what? You must be, you got to be, you have to be born again. You have to be. Because we got girls that were bridesmaids, don't not even speaking to the bride anymore. You know, Steve Harvey's a judge now, right? <laughs> he's on his 18th marriage, and, and he's a marriage counselor. <laughs> now he's a judge, and I have to say, he judges somewhat fairly. Not as much as Judge Judy. <laughs> and, and yesterday I had a moment just to watch Steve operate. So one case, and Sister Davis, if you didn't take that moment, it's all right with me. <laughs> I took mine. So every case that came before him on, the, on yesterday's broadcast was either a family member against a family member, a best friend against a best friend, and they were, they were rolling around thousands of dollars. One guy borrows, he borrows money, $5,000 from his friend. 
And he borrows it because a close family member is about to have surgery. Well, the surgery got canceled. And then, give him a timetable, right? Within that same period between August when he bought it in September, he's riding in a brand new car mm -hmm. that he put down $17,000. Mm -hmm. So his friend brought him to court. And he wants his $5,000 plus $500 in interest back. That's love. And so he had no remorse. He, he was like, I'm on hard times. He know I lost my job, but you just bought a brand new Tesla. And you paid 17,000 down within a six week period of borrowing 5,000. And he borrowed it to, to help a family member have surgery. And then he's rolling. And in, in these days, young people has to videotape everything. Mm -hmm. So he's rolling down the road talking, about, I'm riding now, I'm riding now. Got my brand new Tesla. <laughs> Within a month of borrowing this man's money, didn't want to, he said he understood that he no longer had a job, so he, he shouldn't be wanted. He'll give it back to him when he can. <laughs> would, you, would you love that person? Would you show love toward that person? Another case was a brother and a sister. They shooting pool. They gamble when they shoot pool, and the boy beat the girl out the money. $1,500 shooting pool. There's a thin line <laughs> between love and hate. The third case was a case where two, um, a bride and a bridemaid fell out because the bride didn't show up at the wedding. The, the bride suing the bridemaids because the bridemaid didn't show up at the wedding. And she just spoiled her wedding day. She got married, but it was spoiled. That's love, right? And that's the kind of love that we have for each other. Our love is always conditional. Now, they have been friends, this bridemaid and this bride, had been friends for 24 years. And when they showed their pictures when they, they were little girls, the bride started weeping and crying. So Steve says, nobody's going to get paid today. But what is going to happen, I want to know if you want to be her friend. Yes. Do you want to be her friend? Then they meet halfway and, and her. Now they have to watch, let the whole world watch that. Conditional. It's conditional. If you bring in the right money, I love you. If you drive the right car, I love you. But when it comes to God, John says, look at, understand, perceive what manner of love. This word manner, what possibility of love? What sort of love? Is this love that the father have the same love that you have? Is that, can you honestly say this is the love I have? This agape love? Most Christians will be honest with you. I ain't even trying to get there. <laughs> Most of them tell you point blank. <laughs> no, that, that's, some, that's God. Let God do that. He says, what manner of love the father has bestowed, bestowed, on us. He has given it to us. This word love is agape. It's, it's unconditional. It's, a, it's affection. It is benevolence. It means that it's a love that we don't deserve. It's a gift. God just gives us love because he's God. Have you ever just walked up to somebody and say, I just want to give you $500 just because you are who you are. Or I am who I am. Okay, $10. I mean, you just walk up. The person is not in need. The person didn't ask you for it. You just walk up and give them what you have. God, not only does he offers love or he bestows love upon us, he is love. God is love. 
His whole character is character of love. And because God is love, this agape type love that God has, it will last forever. When we get ready to marry people, we have a ring. They have a male ring and a female ring. Some rings are just one, some ceremonies are just one ring. But the description of the ring is, it's an endless circle, meaning that your love for each other should have no end. And it's covered, most of them, are covered with a non-tarnishable substance, meaning that your love for each other will never fade away. If it puts a green ring on your finger within a month, it was not a non-tarnishable substance. But the indication is, I love you so much until my love for you will never fade away. I love you just that much. For bad and for worse, for rich and for poor. Thickness and in thinness. And sickness and in health. I, I love, I, I pledge my will to you. God has pledged his will to us. He has pledged his love to us unconditionally. And God knew what we would do. And God knew where we would stand. He still loved us. John says, behold, what manner, what kind, what positivity type of love, what possible love can this be? that God the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Everybody, everybody everywhere will let you know, whether they're Christian or not, they'll let you know, I'm a child of God. Why do they say that? I'm a child of God. Are they correct? I'm a child of God. Are they wrong? I'm a child of God. Okay, students in the back of the room. <laughs> students in the middle of the room. So, why do people say I'm a child of God? Why have you said I'm a child of God? What do we mean when we say a child of God? Brother Whitlock, what is, what is that? Child of God. We, we are children of the great I am God. What, what are we talking about? It also means that you have been accepted into the family of God. Okay. Meaning you have accepted uh, his son as your, as your Lord and Savior. You have been baptized into the family of, of God. Okay, so he said that we have accepted Jesus Christ and become a part of the family of God. What happens and what is meant when they say, I'm a, I'm a child of God? You know, when, when rappers get on stage and, and, and Oscar winners win their Oscars and, and they say, I want to thank my God. Well, that's just simply them saying, I was created by God. Okay, that's what I'm at. So everybody can say that they are children of God when you talk about the creation. But I tell you now, they're not talking about the creation. They, they're giving really glory to God. As if they can. So the deal is, the deal is, we are the children of God. We are called the children of God. We are the children of God. We are called, meaning that we now have that name. The word call means to name. The word call means to utter out loud. So we, God utters us out loud. God calls us his children because now we're in the family of faith. Welcome to the family of faith because now you're under the umbrella of such astonishing, amazing, uncompeted love of God, agape love. What kind of love is that? And I'm not talking about storge love, where, where a mother loves her children so much until she go down to jail with them. 
I'm not talking about storge love. I'm, I'm not even talking about phileo love when one brother loves another even though they weren't born by the same mother. I'm not talking about filial love or filial love. I'm not even talking about eros love or eros or eros love. That's the love that a man has for a woman and a woman has for a man. And in order for it to be real eros love, it has to be a male and a female. A woman has that love for a man and a man has that love for a woman. But what I am talking about is agape love. John says, what manner of love is this? He said, I've never seen anything like it before. This is really blowing my mind is what John is saying. Not only does he love us, he go ahead and identify with us and tell us that we are his children. And tells the whole world we're his children. He owns us. He commits to us. He owns us in the presence of other people. Now let me tell you, that's love. When children get around 12, 13 years old, they don't want mama to park out in front of the school mm -hmm. and, and let them out. And if she does let them out, they don't want daddy and mama to lean over the seat and kiss them. No, don't do that. My friend's going to see you. They don't want to own them. They don't want to identify with them. But this God that we have, the ultimate judge, the exceeding God, the magistrate God, the all-powerful, almighty God owns us. He admits that we are his children. John said, my, my, my. That's amazing. Isn't that amazing to you? Now, you know you. you. You know you. You can fool me, but you know you. And because you know you, you know what your crooks are. You know what your crooks are. It takes God to make crooked places straight, to make mountains and mole hills low. And if you don't have God, you're already in trouble. He says, I'm just blown away. He says, I'm, I'm not amazed. He said, therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. The word world is cosmos in the Greek. It means the arrangement of things. It, it means those things around us and, and the authorities and the principalities around us. That world that's unsaved doesn't know us because they didn't know him. Look at what he says. He says, therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. We're so directly connected to God until people won't know us unless they know him. Have people ever told you it doesn't take all that? That church going, Bible study, you, you don't need all that. And now Corona has given us a big old excuse. You sure don't have to go to church. You don't need all, it doesn't take all that. But the world doesn't know us. The world doesn't understand us. The world is not sure about us. The world can't speak for us. And the world has not come to a resolve. Where have you heard these words? Let it be resolved. And be it resolved. At funerals, right? Be it resolved. What, what, what are they saying? People type those words. What, what are they saying? Be it resolved. It means to make known. We've come to a conclusion here. It says, it means be sure and know this. We talk about knowing. Be sure about it. 
Matter of fact, we are speaking up for you. When the words are penned by the pastor or the pastor's secretary or, or whatever it may be, it says, we as a church have come to this conclusion. First of all, we've come to the conclusion that we're going to comfort this family. We've come to this conclusion that this person's life has made a difference. We've come to this conclusion. Let it be resolved, or be it resolved, that we, the members of the New Beginning Church, is praying for this family. So this word no means to, to come to the resolve, to, to be resolved, to come to the conclusion, and to be sure. It says, it says, therefore, the world does not know us. They have not come to the correct conclusion about us. They, they haven't figured us out yet. And the only reason they don't know us is because they don't know him. And we ought to be getting to know him. We ought to be getting to know him every day. Brother told me, he said, man, I don't, I don't need to come to Sunday school. I grew up going to Sunday school. I don't need, I don't need that. I, I, know, I know better than that. That's what I said, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Have mercy, Lord. No, so, so we're like, why did I say that? Why did I say, Lord Jesus? Why, why didn't I just get into an all-out demonstration with him? Man? There's no need to try to, to argue with somebody that said something that foolish. <laughs> you, you have resolved <laughs> that, that that didn't make sense? The Bible is always right and we're always wrong. There will be those who think more of themselves than they ought to. There will always be those who think that they got it going on when they don't. And they will attack the very fabric of Christianity to prove their point. That I, I got it going on. So it says, be resolved in the fact that they don't know us because they don't know him. Verse 2. Beloved, beloved is dear my favorite right. This word beloved means my dear favorite right, my, my esteemed. Saying to us that we are esteemed by God and therefore the apostle John calls us the beloved. The special one. The, the favorite ones. And that's how, that's how the word in the Greek says it. Dear favorite. And it didn't say favorite. It says favorite. In other words, God has blessed us in such a way until he respects us as his children and he even calls us his favorites. And we thought all these years that Israel was the only favorite. So if God has called us his favorite, favorite, he has called us his favorite, then don't you think he's going to do some things for us who are his favorite or favorites that he doesn't do for other people? Lord, I pray to you. You think so? Lord, name. Maybe. Yeah, I think so. I if, think we, so. if we are on his team, he's going to support his team. And things happen. Do, do, do bad things happen to good people? Yes. yes. Do bad things happen to Christian people? Yes. Do people want to give up? I have. Yes. They want to give up? Yes. The songwriter says, I almost gave up. He says, I was on the verge of quitting. But God rescued me. The psalmist, the psalmist says, my feet had well nigh slipped. My steps were almost gone. But God blessed me. And he kept me. And guess what he says? I didn't understand the wicked and why they would continue to get blessed. But it wasn't until I went into the house of God the sanctuary 
that I understood they had a terrible end. Yes. So he says, Behold, now we are children of God, verse number two, and it has not been revealed what we shall be. Yeah, we're children of God now. We, we are, we're basking in the glory, many of us. We are, we are on top of the world. We're living better than we ever lived because we're on God's side, right? But what we going to be hadn't even been revealed yet. What we're going to be has not been shown forth yet. What we're going to be <laughs> has not been exposed yet. Look at what it says. Behold, now we are the children of God. Reminds us again. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. Some things are going to happen to us that we can't even contain. We can't even imagine. When you look at the book of Revelation, the apostle John is talking on an island called Patmos. He's out in the middle of nowhere. There were no churches there. There was no, He was just exiled out in Patmos. Theologians believe that the biggest thing that was there was bramble bushes that were kind of roll, weeds just kind of rolling around. But he said he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He heard behind him a great voice. And that voice said, write what you hear. And let me just share with you. God is still revealing things, but those things have to be lined up with the word of God. It has not been revealed what we're going to be like. We got something to shout about every time we think about it. First of all, we ought to think about this awesome God who, who loves us unconditionally. Then this awesome God who calls us his children. Then we talk about the fact that when we get further down the road, we cannot even imagine what God is going to make us do, what he's going to turn us into, what we're going to be like. Isn't that something? I don't want to ask you, are you looking forward to it? Because you may think I'm get a, I got a bus load out there today. <laughs> but we're going to be different. Our mortality will put on immortality. No more dying. No more pain. No more Arthur Northritis. Oh that we will be different. See, when we were saved, salvation, we were saved... We were saved out of sin. We were saved from the penalty of sin. We were pulled out of sin, saved from going to hell, burning in a burning hell, the penalty of sin. As we work every day toward perfection, we are saved from the power of sin, sanctification. So we have salvation, we have sanctification. We are saved from the very power of sin. That's why what we do, the Bible says, we are led astray by our own lust and desire. That that word lust is. What is, what is the word lust? What is, what is lust? Desire. Our own desire. We, we are led astray by our own desire. We are led astray by what we want to do. Yes, a man stood on January 6th and said, let's march down take, and take over the Capitol. But guess what? All of them already wanted to do. Police officers, military men and women, they already had it in their heart to go hand-to-hand -to -hand in combat against police officers, to take lives, hang Mike Pence, yeah, they were ushered into it, they were pushed into it, they were unctioned into it, but at the end of the day, they already had that desire. They'd already sent emails and, and text messages and tweets saying it's going to be on like popcorn. If they were African-American, all of them, that's what they would have said. But 
they said some other thing. It's gonna be on. It's gonna be. It's gonna be popping. It's gonna be going. It's gonna be lit. It's gonna be lit. But it's only because of their own desires. It's because of their only desire. Their own desires. He says, "We are children of God, and it, and it has not yet been revealed what we gonna be like, or what we shall be. We gonna be somebody. We gonna be different." You won't be known by what you're known by now. Car salesmen, they won't be known as car salesmen. We have to understand our goal is to be like Jesus. What does he say? He says, he says, it has not been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Don't skip over that word reveal. When he appears. When we see him with our eyes. Because Jesus is already here. Y'all know that, right? Jesus. Sister Bernie, you, you ring in here? You think Jesus is here? Yeah, he's here. So if Jesus is already here, he, ha he just has to be revealed. He needs to be manifest. We, we, we um, have waves in this room. We have sound waves. We have radio waves in this room. Right now, we can't hear it. They exist. We got Wi-Fi in this room. Thank God. Hopefully it stays up. We have Wi-Fi in this room. We can't see it. But it's here. We need a device, a radio, in order to tune in the waves in this room. FM, AM. If we bring an AM, FM radio in here and we tune it in, and when it, when it gets close, it's like, and then it sets in place. In other words, we have to tune in Jesus. He's here. He has not been revealed the way he's going to be revealed. But one thing we know. When he is revealed, we will be like him. Have you imagined being like Jesus? When he is revealed, we're going to be different. Doesn't matter if I have an afro or not. We're going to be different. Doesn't matter if you can run a 100-yard dash fast or not. We're going to be different. And the difference is we're going to be like him. I'm telling you, that's good news. That's good news. Let me tell you, everybody in this room have something from their family members. They either look like them, act like them, think like them, got mannerism like them. But above all that, I want to be like Jesus. Now, they used to sing a song. The Pearl Gospel Singers used to sing a song back home that I, even as a boy, I was like, I don't want none of that. The song was, I want to be like Jesus every day. I want to walk like him. I want to talk like him. I want to live like him. And then that's when they lost me. Because they said, I want to die like him. <laughs> and then they took it, took, it, took it around again and said, I want to be like Jesus. And even as a little boy, I'm saying, uh, something ain't right about that statement. Because the fact is, Jesus has already died. And he died once for all. And he, had, he didn't have to die again. And the good news is we don't have to die either. Matter of fact, Jesus says, he that has me has life for now on. Isn't that something? He says that, that when he is revealed, when he comes back, he's coming to get a church, a bride, without a spot or a wrinkle. Come and get a bride. Have you ever wondered about that? 
When I look around, have you ever said, now, Lord, our church ain't a spotless church right now. Our church got issues. Have you ever looked around your church and say, now, the Bible says, and I know the Bible is right. The Bible says he's coming back to get a church without a spot or wrinkle. We don't have just wrinkles. We got whole creases. Matter of fact, we got torn fabric. But he's coming back to get a church without a spot or wrinkle. What he's saying to us is the fact that there's something that we can do, and then there are other things that we can't do that God will do. He will make us like him. That's enough to shout on Wednesday about. That's right there, that's that, look at what God can do. He says, we, we will be like him when he's revealed. We're going to be just like your thought pattern will be different. Your maturity will be different. One of the worst videos that I, I've seen when it, when it talks about the, the Christian church is, is when, when a, a man drives into to this big mega church, he, he, he drives up, he parks his car and runs in the door, and people are weeping and crying, and there are clothes all over the place where people have gotten out of here in the rapture. The rapture. Mm -hmm. He coming with money. And the Pope preacher, he's still there too. <laughs> Lord have mercy. So, so we have to understand when Jesus comes, when he's revealed, when he's revealed, that means that he's going to be shown forth. And because he's already here, he just needs to manifest himself, show, show himself. And when he's revealed, we shall see him as he is. What that says is, we don't really know who Jesus is. We know him from a salvific standpoint. We know him from a sanctification standpoint. But we're going to know him from a glorification standpoint. Because we've not only been saved from the penalty of sin, not only have we been saved from the power of sin, we also are going to be saved from the presence of sin, which is glorification. We're going to have some glorified bodies. So, Sir Bernie, you're going to have a glorified body. You are saved, right? All right, just check. So, you're going to have a glorified body. No sickness, no pain, good God Almighty. No suffering, no backbiting, no lying on you. I told you before, when we get to heaven, we may not know who's who, but you're going to be shocked at who came and who didn't. Because we can play that role. We, we know when to clap. We know when to shout. We know when to speak. We know when to stop speaking. We, we, we have been churchanized. And when you've been churchanized, Brother Miles, you know how to do it. Oh, he closed and now everybody stand up. So we're going to be like him. Verse 3. And everyone who has this hope. How many? Yeah. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself. Just as he is pure. Okay, English students. What's the root word of purify? Pure, right? And when you read this text, very short verse here, and when you read it in English, you're going to say the word purify and the word pure are one and the same because the root word is the same. That's how we're taught in English, right? But when John wrote this and we look at it in the Greek, purify and pure are two different words. First of all, he says, he says, and everyone who has this hope, everyone who has this expectation, everyone who has this faith, everyone who has this confidence, everybody who has this confidence, this confidence that they have in Jesus Christ purifies himself. 
This first word purify means to sanctify, means to become holy, means to be made holy. Purifies him, self. Didn't say Jesus was going to purify him, they purify himself. So what is he saying? We purify ourselves. What, what is he saying to us? What is he saying? Purify. How do you purify yourself? Because I know you, you strong Christians in the Lord. I know y'all strong Christians because y'all in Bible study. People don't just show up at Bible study. So how do you purify yourself? Anybody? How do you purify yourself? I would say to uh, ask for forgiveness for my sins. Uh, okay, ask for forgiveness for your sin. Anybody else? Live like God wants you to live. Live a righteous Christ. life. Yeah. So it's with love. Brother with love. So it's with love. Go ahead. Say again. Spend time in God's word. Spend time in God's word, purifying yourself. So it's what? Ask for forgiveness. Ask for forgiveness. Repent. So we, we purify ourselves, right? And, and because we have this hope, which hope? You got to go back up two verses. We have this hope that Jesus Christ will appear again. We have this expectation. And because we have this expectation, we looking forward to him coming back. Anybody looking forward to him coming back? Anybody? We're looking forward to him coming back again. We're looking forward to being like him. Purifying ourselves. And because we're looking forward to being like him, guess what we do? We make sure we keep a clean life. Purifying ourselves. But look at this last word, pure. Just as he is pure. This word pure doesn't mean to sanctify yourself. If you look at the Strong's, the Strong's word and the Strong's number, you have two different numbers, right, Brother Miles? Yes, sir. Brother Miles sit there every Wednesday and check me out on, <laughs> on uh, he checks me out on, uh, my sword Bible and make sure my Greek and my Hebrew is right. <laughs> and then he'll, every now and then he'll lean over to Sister Brown and say, see that? <laughs> <laughs> so there, there are two different words when you talk about purify and pure. The word purify means, in this particular verse, it means to sanctify yourself. But then when it talks about Jesus, Jesus does not have to purify himself. He does not have to make himself holy. He just is. It is the word innocent. It is the word perfect. When we look at purify in this text, we are making ourselves clean. When we look at the word pure, when we're talking to Jesus, talking about Jesus rather, we are talking about the innocent one who has never, ever sinned. He is the one who is perfect. There is none like him. He's perfect. Are you perfect? Well, why God say, be ye perfect as I am perfect? Why God say, does God ask us to do something we can't do? Strive to get there. Strive it. What's the word perfection? Don't we want perfection? Don't we want to be like him? Well, that word means to be mature or to be complete. Okay, so to be complete or to be, be mature, to ever be growing in Christ. We ought to always be growing in Christ Jesus. We ought to always be growing. We ought to always purify ourselves. Because the one that's coming is already pure. is already perfect. And the only way that he's going to come get us is that we work daily to be purified. Trusting the story that Jesus died, buried and rose again, 
And that statement, that story, that analogy only is the only way we can get to heaven. That's it. I mean, that, that's it. And, and preachers spend years, teachers spend years in school just to come back to the church and tell you that a man died on a tree. And he was buried in a borrowed tomb. And he rose from the dead. 30, 40, 50, 60, some $100,000 to come back to the pulpit, to come back to the teacher's spot and tell you about the man that died on the tree. He was an innocent man. He died for you and he died for me. And that man, Jesus Christ, is pure. And you ought to be striving to be like him. Amen. The door is open. The invitation is extended. If you never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, this is your moment. Try him. He will help you. Purify yourself. If you have never trusted Jesus as your Savior, you can bow your head right now and invite him into your life. We all struggle with stuff, but Jesus is the low lifter. He helps us. He blesses us. If you would, bow your head and repeat after me and invite Jesus Christ into your life. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We believe that if you honestly prayed this prayer, believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you're born again, you're on your way to heaven when you die and there may be some who who struggle with sin who every time they would to do good evil is with them you are saved but you're living a carnal life let me pray with you Father God in heaven it's in the name of Jesus the Christ that I bring us before you bless us Lord forgive us Lord move upon our lives keep us Lord Bless us, Father God, that we will always do things to give you the glory. Bless us with the strength, the power, to push the devil away, that you will be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. There may be others of you who don't have a church home or in between church homes. Just inbox us and let us know that you want to be a part of the New Beginning Church where Jesus Christ is a captain, where Jesus is the main attraction in the center of attention. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for being a part of our service, our Bible study. Please come and be a part every Wednesday at 715. We'll be glad to have you. We're praying for the Turner family. We're praying for the Turner family and the, and the um, transition of Miss Turner, longtime friend and a former co-worker, Sister Davis. We're lifting that family up in prayer. So the Turner family, the Turner family, we're going to lift them, lift them in prayer. Are there any praise reports or prayer requests? Praise reports or prayer requests? Yes, ma'am. I have a praise report. Um, I have my eye done. Amen. Thank God for all the great things that he is doing. 
want to thank God for how he is moving even in the midst of our congregation. He is the almighty God. Yes. If we trust him, he'll, he'll hold it together. we got to trust him. Amen. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you, Father God, for the turn of family. We thank you, Father God, for the testimony of Sister Darrington. Now, Lord, we pray that you bless this turn of family. Heal them and strengthen them in this moment of bereavement. Walk with them and bless them, Father God. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to be their comfort and be their guide, even in times like these. Bless in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. It is now offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It is time to give to the Lord. And I have failed for the last two weeks and two Sundays to say if you want to give electronically, you can do so by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand and you will be served.
and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, in I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. You are dismissed. Thank you so much for joining us.